Okay. Good evening, everyone. Thanks for coming along tonight. My name is Fiona McGarry. I am the president of the UCU here at Queen's. Um, my colleague, Professor John Barry, invited me along to chair tonight's meeting. Um, jo Professor John Barry, he's from the School of HAP here, History, Anthropology, Politics and Philosophy. And we're also expecting our colleague, Patrick Mulholland, another veteran trade unionist. I've actually heard the door. It'd be interesting if that was him now. Nope. <laughs> um, and then online, we are also joined by Mr. David Gibney. Um, I can't see the screen, but I know he's there. Say hi, Dave. Hi. Um, and we're going to be talking tonight about the role of trade unions and the just transition. Now, as a trade unionist, whenever I first thought about green issues and climate change and all in the context of trade unions, the first thing I thought was, oh, geez, like we'll have to do that as well. Like we're fighting inequality, we're fighting for equal pay. We're fighting against precarious contracts, demoralizing destructive workloads, precarious contracts. There's so many things we're doing. Um, now we're saving the planet too. But then whenever I thought about it, I realized, of course we are. Of course we are. It's a perfect fit. The panel are going to talk about why. So I'm going to hand over to John. Go ahead. That's great. Thank you, Fiona. So our first speaker is going to be uh, my colleague, David Gibney. Um, he's going to talk about not just a transition, a transformation. So, Dave, you're very welcome. It's great to be invited to speak about environmental issues, which is something that I've been paying attention to for quite some time. Uh, working for Mandate Trade Union, I usually get invited to speak about precarious work, uh, insecure work. Uh, I was one of the people leading the campaign in the South there around the uh, banded error contract bill, or what became the, the Employment Miscellaneous Provisions Act in 2019, which gives workers guaranteed. Uh, weekly income after 12 months service. So that, that, that's um, just sort of an introduction to who I am. You know, as I said, I work for Mandate Trade Union, which is 70% female. Uh, all, almost all of our members would be extremely low paid um, on the on the bread line. Several members and shop stewards I've met over the last couple of years have been one of those 10,000 people in the statistics around homelessness as well, living in B&Bs or living in, um, in, in hotels. Um, and it's a particularly difficult time for them, as you'd imagine, coming up to Christmas. But uh, yeah, so um, that's sort of some of my background. I've, 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 I get into some of the other bits around what I've campaigned on over the last 10 or 12 years as a trade unionist. Um, I used to be a postman myself, uh, and that's how we got involved in the trade union movement. I was a shop steward there. But I'm going to kick on with the uh, the reason we're here and, and talk about make sure this works. Um, yeah, so as we all know, so the particular focus on it over the last couple of weeks are off, uh, and stuff, but uh, we're going to pay for climate change one way or another. Uh, first group that could pay for it, it's about who pays for it, really, and the first group that could pay for it is workers, labour. And the other group that could pay for it is capital. And, and the final group, which is the one that most of us would want to protect, is future generations, and they'll pay for it through a, a deteriorated climate, uh, a destroyed planet. Um, so with all, within all of that, there's uh, some things to be conscious of as I go through this presentation. And a large part of it is around power dynamics, about who has power. Uh, because we can see political decisions being made uh, around this stuff and not going far enough in, in, in so far as taking adequate active action to protect the planet. Uh, but as we get closer and closer to the destruction of the planet, they're really going to put a bit of focus on the first two there, labour and capital. My presentation is really about, uh, mostly about the labour side, but as you can imagine, the trade unions. Um, and in terms of can labour camp workers uh, pay the price? First of all, I'm going to qualify this as well by saying that most of my stuff is based on the sense, and the trade unions does have a really good heart, so just bear with me around some of that stuff. But being knowledgeable that the North, <laughs> the North Northern Ireland is, uh, is probably the most comparable when it comes to low pay. Labour share of GDP for rising wages and social protection transfers. Uh, so it's basically your income, workers' income, higher income. Uh, you can see there Switzerland, Netherlands. And what what labour share of GDP means is the amount of the slice of pie that the workers get out of the economy. Um, and as you can see, there's Ireland on the bottom. So when they tell us that workers can pay, and workers and households are going to have to pay for this, we have to take that with a pinch of salt about around who can pay. 
um, we're one of the lowest paying economies in the Western world. In incidence of low paying OECD countries, you can see Ireland there second on, on the right. 23% of all jobs in our economy in the South are, 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 are officially designated as low paying jobs. United Kingdom there is in blue, you can see it there uh, on 19, and then the OECD total average is 15. So we've got a huge amount of low paid jobs that are around. And again, as I said, I work in the, for a retail sector union. Statistics that we got recently around this from Eurostat showed that in employee compensation uh, in the wholesale and retail sector uh, as a whole was quite low, uh, second lowest in, um, in 15. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, it's behind the UK. The UK is the only uh, other country that was in the EU at the time that had lower paid, lower paid workers in wholesale and retail. Employee compensation, you might hear the argument being made, particularly on the news uh, and radio stations down south, you hear them saying, but we have a really high minimum wage. Uh, and we do, we have a very high minimum wage, but we have very low employee social insurance. And that's basically a tax break for the employers at the top. Um, I can get into that in great detail because it's something that the, the trade unions in the South have been trying to uh, change in recent, uh, particularly since COVID kicked in, because it's one of the reasons we don't have an NHS and we have a really terrible healthcare system is because we don't, employers don't pay their fair share of employer social insurance. And if they did pay, the average of the EU, the state would have an extra 8 billion euros to spend on healthcare or education. And to give, put that in context, 8 billion euros is um, is the amount we spend on education every year, paying every teacher and all capital infrastructure on education. So it gives you an idea of the amount of tax credit that employers are getting on, on, that, on that side of it. If an Irish retail worker was to get the pay of another retail worker within EU 15 countries, that would mean they'd need to get a 20% pay increase overnight. That's how low paid they are. If they were to compare to a northern and central European economy, they'd need a 35% pay increase overnight. But we often hear workers well, we're all being told again through the mainstream media that we have we're a small open economy and therefore we need to compete with them. One thing we don't compete with uh, small open economies on is wages because if we did, workers in retail would need a 54% pay increase to match the wages of a worker in Austria, Belgium, Denmark, and other Sweden. So you can see there again that retail workers are very well paid, and what does that lead to? It leads to Irish multinational retailers being most profitable in 15. To give you an idea of the scale of that profits per employee from Eurostat again in 2015 showed that you can see Ireland on the bottom, profits per employee, the highest in the EU, 40,000 euros profit per employee is the average of what we see in the UK. And then, so that's that's the worker side of things. We're low paid. So when it comes to paying for climate change, the question is, again, go back to the very first slide. Um, can workers afford it, or is there another group of people who can't afford it? My argument would be that the rich can pay a lot more, whether it's capital or individuals are rich. Screenshot this article very long, it's from two weeks ago, but it's nearly got $300 million in the world. So don't come to the low paid retail worker who's struggling to put a roof over their head, struggling to put bread on the head for their kids, uh, and talk to them about being able to retrofit their house. Literally flying in rockets up to, 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 to space uh, for the for the crack. Um, some of the solutions. So just just to link that in with with why why you know, I'm mentioning low paid workers is, and, and it'll all hopefully become clear towards the end of this presentation. But it, they have a just transition. There are solutions and options that are available, and one of them that we keep keep getting trotted out is the carbon tax as the best and most suitable option around this stuff. Now, I'm not in favour of a carbon tax on households. I am in favour of a carbon tax. And I was one of the campaigners back in 2010, 11, 12 in Australia who campaigned for a carbon tax over there. And to compare the two types of carbon tax, I think it's, you know, it, it, it's really illustrative of a policy that's for workers and a policy that's against workers. So the, in Ireland, the carbon tax is a tax on eating your home. It's a tax on travelling to work uh, when we don't have any limited or very limited public transport. And people were paying attention to the media south yesterday and see that, uh, despite all of the talk around investing and, and trying to tackle climate change, 
there won't be a rail line uh, open within the next decade in, in the south. And I'm one of those poor, unfortunate people from the north side of Dublin that's been waiting on the metro since 2002, since it was announced, of course, Metro North. In, um, now since 2002, and now we're being told to be ready by 2031. So I don't think there's a rail line in the world that's ever taken that long to be, to be built. Um, then uh, it basically is again the third bullet point of tax on everyone. Whereas the Australian carbon tax was a really, really innovative uh, tax that was not just about tackling climate change, but was also about redistributing wealth. And I'll explain it a little bit. So it was actually the Labour government in, the, uh, in Australia that brought in the carbon tax in 2012, I think it was. Um, and it, they brought it in on the back of the union I worked for over there, the AMW, the Australian Manufacturing Workers Union, along with a number of other unions that were campaigning for the carbon tax. And what this tax was to do was, see it there in the first bullet point, $23 per tonne tax on 500 of Australia's largest corporations. And that's all it went on. 500 of Australia's largest corporations. It wasn't on households, it was just on those corporations. Uh, steel metal, smell factory, manufacturing, cars, manufacturing, a whole range of, of big items, big ticket items, uh, coal plants. And the way they, they were planning on initially raising $3 billion from the first uh, year of it, and they did actually raise about $3 billion from it. And, and the first component, they broke the, the out of the first part of compensation for Australian So effectively, if you were a manufacturer, say Ford, Ford car, you did everything you could to put back on your um, emissions, and there was nothing further you could do. You, you pay your carbon tax, but you get a refund to you, um, because there's nothing further you could do. But the second one is compensation for low-income households. You used to pay tax in Australia at $6,000. Um, that's when the, the income tax threshold kicked in. They edged that up to eighteen thousand dollars. So effectively, it was a tax cut on the for the benefit of the lowest paid households. But they also gave money to pensioners and people on social welfare. So they were using one billion dollars for that specifically for that. And then the final third of the funding was for uh, of the money raised was, was funding for green technology. And that was why our union was really arguing for this. We had one hundred thousand members in the manufacturing sector. They were all looking at losing their jobs in the back. Of what was going on, we were, uh, we were, we were making the argument that welders, for instance, in a manufacturing plant can easily transfer their skills into um, wind turbines or you know manufacturing green technology of any sort, so, so, whatever. So we were looking for that funds to help transition people into those types of industries, and it worked. Within, I, I wrote an article recently. I haven't looked at it today, actually, but sure. But uh, carbon, in, uh, from memory, carbon in the industries that were impacted went, went down by about eight or nine percent within a year. So it it was a, it had a huge impact. But then, unfortunately, the Tory government got in. Uh, Tony Abbott, climate denier, climate change denier, and he deconstructed the entire plan. Uh, and this is why it's important. I'll get to this at the end. This is why it's important to have trade unions heavily involved and much more powerfully involved in the debate around this stuff because of the democracy. Um, I was one of the coordinators of the Right to Work campaign in the South. Um, I'm not sure if people will be familiar with this one, but we organized 11 major demonstrations, some of which had over 100,000 people on them. One demonstration was 106 separate demonstrations across the country, uh, where we estimated there were 200,000 people turned up. Um, and on even one of the biggest ones we had, that one there is from August 20th, that picture is from August 29th, um, and the whole of Ocon Street was. But we even have one midweek, 10th of December, International Human Rights Day, and 80,000 people turned up on Wednesday in this brand in Dublin, on the wall. Hugely um, popular movement, uh, massive demonstrations that had a huge impact. And people will say, How can you be an environmentalist and campaign against water change? I, I want to just put it on the record here with a couple of these slides to explain good policy, bad policy. This is directly from the website Credit Suisse for a while ago. Water is scarce, but the profits aren't. Water is a focus for those in the know about global strategic commodities. As with oil, the supply is finite, but demand is growing by use, and unlike oil, there is no return. That's directly from Credit Suisse, encouraging people to invest in water services. 
just came over at the same time as the Irish government was trying to implement the water charges. If you don't believe me that they think there's some big conspiracy, go to watermeetsmoney.com because they have a conference every single year. I update this slide every year when I'm talking to people. Uh, next year's uh, Global Water Summit is in Madrid in Spain. And again, it's all of the big players, Hems, Water, Severn, Trent, all these guys who go there along with Veolia, all talk about how they can maximise profits from water. Um, when the UK privatised its water system in 1989, you can see there uh, the, the blue lines, or the blue lines going up is the average water bill, and the black line is the consumer price index. And so you can see, on average, water prices go up at double the price of every other commodity in the economy. Um, but then the question is, who uses our water? And despite all of the attention that we still get around households should pay water charges, we need the households are the ones that are profligate with the water and waste. When you look at how our water system is structured and who uses industry uses 77 percent, and in industry we're talking about agriculture as well as we get to. Data centers and, and, and other types of industries that are, are, are out there. Domestic users of water in the Republic of Ireland is about 23%, uh, but the industry is 77%. And the year that they brought in water charges, what did they do? They reduced the cost of industry and they, because they assumed that they were more money than the domestic households. But specifically, where does our work go? 50% of it is leaked. So instead of spending the 2 billion euros that they spent on setting up Irish water on fixing the leaks, um, they, they could have spent two billion fixing the leaks, but instead they spent it on installing water meters so they could create this profit-driven output across the, the state. Um, so again, leaking just fifty percent, industry thirty-eight percent, and then domestic users twelve percent. Now, even in Irish Water's own figures, they said that the maximum maximum that they would expect that people would reduce from bringing the water charges, bringing the water charges, the maximum they would expect is about six percent reduction. So six percent reduction of about 12%, less than a percent. So all of that money, that two billion euros was, was spent to reduce a fraction of a percent uh, in terms of the usage of water, instead of going after where the big problem lies, both leakages and industry. And of course, it told us people are using too much water in Ireland, so the figures, again, Irish Water's own figures. Irish Water said 54, in, in the south, 50, uh, their average person uses 54,000 liters. Whereas in the UK, who's had water charges in since Early, well, since the early 90s, like 68. So we use 25% less water than countries with water charges. So why would they bring in this stuff in? Uh, and instead of instead of doing what they should have done, which was to tap the polluters, data centers. We've seen in, in the last couple of months, and, and again, I, I hope people are familiar with this, but the amount of data centers that are open up down so, um, it is phenomenal. But whether you're talking about water, which I'm uh, I'll just put it in the picture here. One data center in the center is using more water than the entire town of Dundalk. 40,000 liters of water. One data center. And we've got over 50 data centers in the world that grow. And they're just, there's just no sign of it stopping, and nobody seems to want to stop. And the government are on record said we need to, we want to encourage more data centers to open. So uh, it's one of the reasons we have water shortages over the last couple of years is because of the open data centers. When I say water shortages, water cutoffs are shortage in, in the Dublin area um, in particular because these data centers mostly want to open up around the Dublin area because that's where Facebook is, that's where Amazon is, that's where Twitter is, their head offices. They don't want to move where water is, and water is over on the west coast mostly, um, or near the Shannon. So instead of that, what they're doing is they're moving the Shannon to Dublin. They're spending almost two billion euros in redirecting water from the Shannon to Dublin because these data centers are there. So I think there's better ways we could spend our money than redirecting. Um, and again, another one is bottled water companies. They don't pay a penny for the water that they use. Uh, there's no abstraction charges in the centers for the issues we've registered, the whole campaign. Um, you can, a, a Ballygown, Rick Big, is the owner of Ballygown, the government of the London Stock Exchange, uh, make huge profits and use the profits that they make here, by the way, to open up the uh, water, water companies over in Brazil a couple of years ago. But they don't pay a penny for the water they abstract. And when the government was talking about bringing in abstraction charges and they paid with the legislation last year, it just so happened that the limits that they had, 2 million litres of water per day, was less than any bottled water company or any data centre uses in a day, anyway. So uh, there wasn't a single data centre or bottled water company that was going to have to pay a penny when the government was bringing in abstraction charges. So again, 
if you're a, a, a granny trying to have a bath on a, on a Saturday night and want to charge you for a if you're a, a bottle of water from abstracting two million liters of water per day, no, not a thing. And again, I, data centers I could have talked about the electricity stuff or expecting blackouts this uh, winter as a result of the uh, data centers. I think um, uh, this was a presentation given from John Toronto recently where he said that 70% of our electricity will be going into data centers uh, by 2030 potentially. It would be somewhere between 30% and 70% of our electricity of course, the national heard an awkward conversation to have with farmers, but that's why just transition is so important. Uh, it's, uh, I'll get into just, just transition stuff in a few minutes, but as we know, beef and dairy farmers, uh, or beef, that's not the farmers, but beef and dairy industries, cattle and finally airlines. Um, you know, how is it that we have to have a carbon tax on households? We get rid of the airlines don't pay anything on their um, on airline fuel. So you can see there. Top 10 carbon emitters in Europe, Reiner, uh, uh, entered that uh, number a couple of years ago. The others, I think, are all coal fired power plants or something. So, uh, Reiner, the first, uh, you should be very proud of them in Ireland, first one to, to, to come into that. But then they go and tell us that they're uh, all about climate change and protecting the environment. So, I just, I just Ireland, what would it look like? It can't be another Devon style redundancy package um, where we just pay over money to people and, and basically make, make them retire. It has to be about a proper transition, giving them decent jobs uh, to continue working in. Um, because there's mental health impacts associated with that. That's, that's certain things around redundancy. So um, we really need to make sure that it's a proper just transition, particularly in the Midland area in, in the South. Um, but what has to come with it is universal basic services. So we need an NHS style healthcare system. Again, you might have heard stuff in the media recently. We're about nearly two years into a pandemic and still no increase, none in our intensive care unit capacity. Um, so we, we really, really need proper investment in healthcare, as well as housing 10,000 homeless people, as I mentioned. Um, education, childcare, transport, food and water security and then energy and broadband, and, and the energy, broadband, and food, and, and water security stuff comes with the next point, which is about encouraging non-profit enterprises to stay homish. There's certain things that should never be put into the private market, and we can see the impact of the privatization of water services in the UK, and especially in recent weeks. So we need to learn the lessons from what's happened there. When they privatized water in Paris, they, uh, water prices went up by 260 or 8 percent before Paris had to be and these remunicipalizations, these renationalizations of water and other companies around are, are happening around um, Europe all the time, and it's cost a fortune. And we can get into CETA if we want, but if CETA gets in, you can't renationalize any assets in terms of cost you too much. Um, but it's really important that we encourage non profit enterprises, especially cooperatives and, and state ownership. Um, and then on, on this next point, tax capital and or enable work to be the larger share of I'm in favour of the and, so tax capital and maybe working a larger share. And I'm going to get into that. that this, that's the gist of my main gist of my presentation is about democratising the workplace to have a financial strategy. It's so important to be able to So I want to see a fair work act in the South and in the North. Uh, I want to see three elements to that. One is to make it easier to join the trade union. Second is to make it uh, easier to collectively bargain. And third is to make it easier to take industrial action. Um, I'm going to talk around each of them for a second. So, in terms of uh, make it easier for people to join trade unions, right to access. As a trade union organizer over in Australia, I have the right, um, a legal right, to fax any company anywhere in Australia and turn up the next day and to be given a room to talk to the workers about a number of items. First of all, collective bargaining, but I could also do inspections. I could do health and safety inspections as a trade union organizer, and I could do workplace rights compliance inspections as well. And I gave a great insight into what was happening on the ground. It meant that there was less abuse of workers. They could, they could turn up anywhere. It didn't have to be unionized employment. It could be just a random Starbucks or whatever, and they'd have to provide me a room to talk to them. We need that type of entitlement in Ireland across the island. Uh, 
um, because it, it holds employers to account. There's huge amounts of money being lost to rogue employers in Ireland at the moment from, uh, from wage theft. Um, collective bargaining rights, um, right now in the South, you just have stronger collective bargaining rights in the North, but collective bargaining rights in the South are completely absent. There's no, we, we do not have any collective bargaining rights. No. America has collective bargaining rights. Australia has, the UK has, the whole of Europe has, no. Ireland has no collective bargaining rights. What that means is workers, when they come together, even if 100% of the workforce says we want to collectively bargain, we have no one to collectively bargain, uh, and we need that change. I don't want to talk through all of the stuff because the first two cover most of it, but anti victimization and unfair dismissal, of course, the uh, trade union deduction, the source of right to act. Um, the example I always give to people is because it was a, 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 one of the few cross EU strikes that we saw in recent years ago. But remember the Ryanair strike a few years ago, the pilots were all going on the strike. It was a real eye opener for me was when the German pilots uh, issued a notice. To, to, to their customers in Germany to say, we're giving you 24 hour notes that we'll be taking industrial action tomorrow. And they didn't have to do that because they go, go on strike immediately. In the South, and I believe in the North as well, you need to give seven days notice to take industrial action. And that seven days notice is seven days that the employer can intimidate workers into not taking action. Um, workers need the ability to seek more hours. I spoke at the very start of a banded hour contract uh, legislation, which we would in the South. Encourage people to go there and get active and try and get that legislation implemented in the north. This is very, very uh, important. Our, our members have you know, seen these phrases all the time because um, their employer, if they took industrial action, used to be able to reduce their hours from 40 hours per week down to 15 hours per week. And nothing could be done about it because it's it's very, it, it just it's a component of zero hour or low hour contracts that these types of actions can, can take place. So. Uh, but on top of that, you need workers to be able to seek more hours when they want them to help them get out of the poverty trap. Uh, state sports are constantly going into employers who are again, rogue, um, employers that refuse to collectively bargain. There should be no state support for any employer that doesn't recognise a worker's right, in human right, to collectively bargain to be represented by a trade union of their choice. And again, training and education, a bad vote of self employment. I'm going to wrap up quickly because I know I'm probably well over time, but um, this chart shows us the wages, I, again, going back to the start, and what, what I raised at the start, wages as a proportion of the economy. Wages as a share of GDP declined faster in Ireland than in any other country in the OECD except for, I think, it's Mexico. Um, we have the second lowest wages of, uh, as a share of uh, GDP, our second or third lowest out of all of those countries. Um, you can see there as well, in the United Kingdom, it declined fairly rapidly too. Um, and that leads into the next slide. You can see a sort of a, a correlation between these but trade union density levels. So it's a bit of a chicken or egg question here. Trade union density levels have been declining since that period of time uh, when at highest wages as a proportion of the economy. Um, so we've gone from 56, 57% all the way down to about 23%. In the private sector, in the south, trade union density level is less than 13%. It's tiny. Um, and what that means in terms of a uh, just transition is that we saw during the economic collapse. Employers got to do whatever they wanted to workers' contracts and the because unions were instructed to do And you can again see that here. Days lost in industrial disputes from 1960 to 2018. Um, you can see in the year that I was born, in 1979, there were 1.4 million days lost in industrial action. Workers took strike action on 1.4 million days. And a couple of years ago, I think it was 2018, that dropped to 3,800 days. 1.4 million days down to 3,000 days is just massive decline in, in power and muscle of the trade union movement. And unfortunately, it doesn't look like it's getting any better. Uh, but if we want to have a just transition and we're going to ask capital to pay, capital's going to try and pass that on to workers. And workers need to be able to resist that and fight that. And that's why a Fair Work Act so important right now in terms of the just transition. Um, because the consequences of not having a just transition partly is if workers are disempowered um, and, and, and are frustrated and are living day to day um, and paycheck to paycheck, they're not going to engage or be sympathetic to uh, taking uh, adequate action on climate change. I think um, I spoke to Stevie Nolan about this a couple of weeks ago uh, and he 
the sense of uh, both music company and all that are me, but um, I can't I can't think about the end of the world right now when I'm trying to think about the end of the book. Uh, so we, we can't turn workers away from that. Like, democratizing the economy, helping people to join trade unions and making it easier for them to take action will they'll give them the power and the, the courage to tackle climate change. And if we don't do that, I can assure you and we've seen it already uh, a big result of the last crisis that we faced. And the, the current one under COVID is that we've emboldened the far right wing. We don't have that input, that, that, um, uh, that, that ability to have a say in, in what decisions are being made. That's what trade unions do. And then obviously the last consequence of not having a just transition uh, flows on from the first bit of that. questions until uh, after uh, my presentation, if you don't mind. Dave, you're just going to probably get um, sound but no picture um, in terms of, uh, I'm going to put up my, my slides now. So thank you very much to Dave for that overview. I'm going to continue um, in somewhat an, an academic but also a, um, a, a unionist activist perspective on, on this. And it's particularly pertinent given, as Dave mentioned, and many of us now know, what's happening over in COP26. And I mean, I had my expectations set pretty low and they've all been achieved. You know, what's now being presented as a great win out of COP is if we keep global heating below 1.8. In 2015, in the Paris Agreement, it was 1.5. That's why it was keeping 1.5 alive was the, the key issue. If we don't get any agreement at all out of COP, we're looking at probably a 2.7 or 3 degree warming, which is utterly catastrophic in terms of many parts of the world uninhabitable, you know, millions of people displaced by climate related events and so on. So this is, while I'm offering an academic perspective, the, the, the kind of practical dimension is that um, I'm speaking not just as a trade unionist, as an academic, but as a parent um, and a citizen who's really, really concerned about the direction we're going in as a global society. This is not just uh, of academic interest, this is going to affect all our lives. Not least in terms of some of the things Dave was talking about, which I'll touch upon, is that the transition to a low carbon economy and the creation of a more climate resilient society is going to change everything in how we live our lives. Um, it's going to change the structure of particularly our energy system and the reality is once you change the, the energy system of any society everything else changes from the food we produce, our transportation, how we heat ourselves and so on. So very much in the same vein as, as David I'm going to you know talk about should we, should we be viewing uh, um, what we're facing as a transition or as a more radical uh, transformation and particularly and this will be of no surprise for those who heard me speak before, not least my poor students, which I'm very delighted to see you here tonight. You're, you're going over and beyond uh, listening to me. That really we need to start uh, opening up the possibility of not just going beyond carbon, but once we do that, we also have to open up the question of going beyond economic growth, as is currently uh, you know, constructed as GDP economic growth. And that inevitably, in terms of a logical sequence, requires us then to open up the possibility of going beyond, beyond capitalism. So you go beyond carbon, which I think everybody agrees with. Going beyond growth, mm, I'm not too sure. Everybody knows what that means and we be a bit scared about it. Going beyond capitalism, of course, then is where you lose a lot of people. But I'm going to propose that that's where we have to go. But before I do, um, and it's a pity we didn't synchronise our events. Uh, this only happened very late uh, last week. So John MacDonald, who some of you may know, John McDonald MP, is going to be coming here in this very room uh, tomorrow night at five o'clock to talk about a sustainable and just uh, economy. So very much in, in the same vein that we're talking about here tonight, and you're all very welcome. But please do go on to the Eventbrite 
um, page and find that so you need to register to, you know, it's free and open to everybody. I mean, where we begin from, from a, a union perspective, but, you know, should also be, a, you could say, a basic human perspective, is that there's no jobs on a dead planet. Uh, and it has to be said that um, some trade unions still aren't there yet with the whole climate low carbon transition, and for good reason. You know, if you're representing coal workers or oil workers, um, there is a natural disposition to be skeptical or reticent uh, about the, the transition. And that needs to be uh, attended to. And I think too many environmentalists are anti coal and oil and gas without fully recognizing that. Uh, we should be actually thanking those industries for creating a lot of the infrastructure that we now currently enjoy. And it sets up a, a, a negative dynamic between uh, people in that industry, the, the workers and the unions and environmentalists and, 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 and scientists who should be working together. I mean, my own view for what it's worth is that we should stop talking about fossil fuels and start reframing them as fossil resources. The problem with coal, oil and gas isn't necessarily with the substance themselves, although there are issues in terms of pollution and often the human rights abuses that go with the extraction of the resource. But actually, can we find non-energy uses for oil in particular? And to me, that's where research needs to be done. And, you know, we're not doing that research here at Queen's or, or anywhere else. I know there is some research going on in Germany. But basically, how can we use those workers and still to some degree extract perhaps that resource, but now not use it to burn, to create electricity or energy. That's the problem. You know, can we find non-energy, non-climate damaging uses for these resources, which is why I think we need to start talking about them as fossil resources rather than fossil fuels. This is a lovely book for those of you who are kind of new to this area, written by former um, Irish president, Mary Robinson, former UN commissioner for refugees. And the book, you can see there ourselves on climate justice. And what's good about the book is that it's stories from the field. So it's not an academic, it's not very heavy policy. It's people in Vietnam, parts of Africa, um, South America, just telling their frontline stories of what it's like to live um, in a climate chaotic uh, world from their perspective. And the quote there, you know, she, she says is that, you know, is that issue of recognizing that an unjust transition would be where we just simply say, that's it, coal, oil and gas, goodbye, and we just leave those workers in particular stranded. Uh, a just transition is that nobody's left behind, is that we include retraining, compensation uh, packages. But I'm going to propose that a just transition uh, should, actually should absolutely include those issues of retraining, or indeed, as it happened in Spain. I mean, Spain has closed all its coal mines uh, just over a year now, and they allowed their uh, workers at 55 to retire, to retire early. Um, for those who didn't want that, they were given retraining packages. Some of them were given entrepreneurial um, you know, uh, training uh, packages as well to open up a business and, 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 and so forth. So it's a really interesting example of a, of a just um, transition. Now, it costs a lot of money, and that's a big issue. Where's the money going to come from? We're talking about a big capital spend in terms of this low carbon transition. So just like Dave, you know, I'm obviously a supporter of the idea of a just transition, but I will um, put out some more um, I suppose critical comments about perhaps it's too reformist in its um, ambition. And just to remind you, in case you didn't know, the whole just transition concept uh, comes from the trade union movement, uh, particularly in America in the 1970s. So it actually is a, a, a trade union uh, concept in its origins. And we have other affiliated ideas and strategies like the Green New Deal, uh, which I'm not a particular fan of, even though it's used quite a bit in policy circles and academia, because it's very American-centric. You have to understand the 1930s Roosevelt New Deal in the 1930s in America to understand what the New Deal is. When you're talking to ordinary people, you say, Green New Deal, is that new decade, new approach, the, you know, the, what, what got the assembly back up and running here last year? I prefer the language of green jobs. People get that, low carbon jobs. Whereas the Green New Deal, uh, or even the European Union's uh, New Deal and so on, um, I, I, I agree with the policies, but the, the language I think is an issue. And that's part of the problem where ordinary people um, are not able to connect with some of this issue. And we, I think we underestimate the importance of using a language that's appropriate that can explain the issue very simply to the people. But this is the tension. 
Uh, is it just a, a, a greening of business as usual, a kind of Keynesian, uh, social democratic, um, what I would call greening of the status quo? So we you know, are just going to use the energy transition to continue with the current basic social and economic structure, what I would call, in probably one of my better um, titled articles, biofueling the Hummer. So we just take out the dirty coal, oil and gas, and we, we stick in clean green energy, but the system doesn't change, as in the economic system, relationships of ownership and control, uh, and so on. Or, you know, is it basically that we want to green capitalism? And that's an issue that I find quite uh, amazing that many people, it's almost like you farted in a room when you even mention capitalism. Uh, people uh, automatically are, are, are made uncomfortable. It is simply a description of the economic system that we live in. Um, and I would say that you can be a supporter of it, but let's call it capitalism. Um, and say, okay, you're a supporter, I, I have a lot of problems with it. Uh, and I think it's reached the point now where it's actually suboptimal. It's kind of similar to fossil fuels. Useful up to a point, and we should thank and be grateful for, for all that we've achieved with fossil fuels. Same with capitalism. And there are certain parts of our economy that probably would work okay uh, in a free market context. I think things like children's toys, for example, Kira, were uh, fine. Uh, maybe iPhones, but things like healthcare, uh, water, uh, electricity, uh, education. These things for me are either natural monopolies, doesn't make much economic sense to have a private competition in a free market context, or that the things that we should re regard as rights, not as commodities. And that's a much more political judgment that we can disagree uh, about that. So the, the alternative to this kind of reformist element of a just transition is that it's a, an opportunity to fundamentally rethink the uh, organization and structure of our economy. So in other words, as we are fixing the energy system to deal with the climate and ecological crisis, we can fix so many other things. In other words, there's a natural synergy between climate justice and also social justice, you know, in dealing with things like how unequal our societies are, or again, as many who you know, you know who've heard me speak before, picking a cold night like this, people not too far away from here in the village, just down the way, will have to make the awful decision: Do I heat or do I eat? Because of the high levels of fuel poverty and also low wages, and the fact that we're so oil dependent often for space heating, although that's getting better now as we move towards gas, and oil is an extremely volatile commodity that goes up and down, as we now see with energy prices increasing uh, both parts of the island. So we did some research um, for the Department for the Economy. Uh, Joe, Joe was here um, tonight, Joe Reynolds. Um, and we tried to map the just transition. I'm just going to give you some of the headline figures. I'm not going to spend too, too long on it. Is that the traditional just transition narrative or strategy is around what do we do with displaced oil, coal, and you know, uh, gas workers? We don't have those large extractive industries in uh, any part of the island, maybe with the exception of the, of the Midlands uh, that Dave mentioned in around, in around Tullamore in the Irish Midlands. So those examples are of, of, of Germany, where they have an exit coal commission. The example I gave you from Spain, uh, and there are some examples also in Australia around coal, they're not really applicable to Northern Ireland. Actually, our concern in Northern Ireland is going to be around consumption, issues of fuel poverty. Uh, not necessarily around uh, the production of picky carbon-based fuel. And actually on you know, electricity production, we've got a good news story to tell that you know, almost half our electricity has come from you know, mostly onshore um, wind. And there is a need, of course, to, you know, to move, not least because of the UK uh, legislation, although we have a bit of a bun fight going on between two different climate bills going through the assembly of our movement towards a net zero carbon economy. And I think this idea of tackling fuel poverty stands as a fantastic uh, way of getting democratic legitimacy and social buy-in for ordinary people for whom climate change, tons of carbon, even issues of sustainability or the UN Sustainable Development Goals are very abstract and don't mean much to them. If we tackle fuel poverty, it's a way of, the, of, of explaining and initiating in our communities if the conversation that we, you know, we can start with housing, but then we have to deal with transportation. And we're also going to deal with our food system, all of which are not going in the right direction from a climate resilient or low carbon point of view. 
Uh, rates of fuel poverty are, well, they're not contested, but there's different methodologies you can use. You know, you can go to the Department for the Communities website and just search for fuel poverty, and, and the figure of 42% comes up. I think that's probably an overestimation. So we've estimated that somewhere between 20 and 40. But even if it's 20% at the lowest end, that's a fifth of households in Northern Ireland are in fuel poverty, which means they're spending more than 10% of their income just to stay at an ambient uh, temperature that's healthy for them. So the issue here is in fixing the energy system, don't always think of energy production. I mean, too often in the media, in discussions, we have this view of the energy transition as taking a certain quantum of carbon energy and replacing it with a certain quantum of low carbon energy. Whereas actually what we should be talking about is energy efficiency. The cheapest and most climate friendly energy is the energy you don't use. That's not sexy. And you could say, is it because it's not profitable to invest in the retrofitting of people's homes and taking them out of fuel poverty? The issue that David mentioned about the national herd uh, stock down, down south is equally applicable up here in Northern Ireland. It's the single biggest sector of greenhouse gas emissions, picking methane from ruminant animals like pigs and, uh, and cows. And that's just uh, it's about 27 percent of our greenhouse gas emissions in Northern Ireland comes from the agricultural sector. Um, and we have a dominance of uh, intensive you know, beef and dairy. We're very good on the island of Ireland at growing grass, basically. That's what we do really, really well. So it's grass-fed uh, beef and particularly um, dairy. And it's a very significant issue. And that's why we do need to start uh, having, uh, and it's already started, but in a, in, a, in a rather negative way, where our farming community has been riled up to be against a, uh, one of the climate bills, uh, which is net zero by 2045. And therefore, farmers are seen as against climate. Uh, so many times I've been on the, the, the media recently, and I'm really annoyed with the media how they've set this up that it's me coming on talking about climate and maybe having a view about which climate bill I support. And then as a farmer, well, not usually a farmer, it's someone from the Ulster Farmers Union. And I'm, oh, that's okay because they're a big uh, greenhouse gas emitter. But what about the other 70% of other sectors for transportation, uh, for electricity, energy? Where are they? And so therefore, I, I think we need to be aware of the way the media uh, has actually colluded in my view, with setting up this farmers versus the climate bills, because there's been an over and disproportionate amount of attention on the impact of farming. You could see it like this. For every 10 media interviews, maybe farmers should have been on three to represent their proportion of greenhouse gas emissions. But where's the other seven? And so on. So there, uh, when the media view this, I'm gently chastising you. There's also a big issue with this battle of the two climate bills, which I won't bore you with. I'm happy to take questions on it. My own view is that we have a, a political judgment based on science and not the way it's been presented in the media, that one bill, the one that says net zero by uh, 2045, and the other bill, which is basically 82% reduction by 2050, that's being presented as science based upon the analysis done by the Committee on Climate Change. In my view, what the Committee on Climate Change has done is offered a political judgment informed by science. It is not somehow fact-based only. There are political judgments in there, and we could argue that. So it's not one that's scientifically based versus one that's somehow political and naive and utopian. They're both based on the similar analysis of the science, just making different political judgments uh, and so on. So we have a politicization of science, if not the scientization of politics. My own view, just transition, as we particularly deal with the uh, code red for humanity, which we have to see that this is not just another policy area. This cuts across everything in terms of every sector of our society, our ways of life are going to be impacted as a result of this. And therefore, for me, and people can disagree with it, I am of the view that our system on the capitalism of growth a, we have no demonstrable empirical evidence that we can decouple a growing economy from pollution, from energy, from greenhouse gas emissions. We have some evidence of some localised, like nitrogen and nitrous oxide in cities can be decoupled. But there's no evidence that we can decouple a growing economy 
from these negative impacts. But yes, if you look at the dominant narrative you see coming out of COP, or indeed you see here locally, it's going for growth. It's greening growth. And if you don't want to believe me, look at a 2019 report that was done by the European Environment Bureau called Decoupling Debunked. Decoupling Debunked. So we have to accept that at some point the growing economy reaches a, a stage of homeostasis or steady state in the same way that nothing in nature grows forever, apart from certain waistlines over lockdown and so on. So the issue here is really important for understanding capitalism. Capitalism is like a bicycle. It either goes and grows or it collapses. That's it. It has a recession or depression or it's it has the boom bust cycle. It has, you know, from a systems thinking point of view, it has no negative feedback mechanisms. And a normal capitalist economy, just to stay stable, has to grow by about 3% a year. That doesn't sound too bad. But what that means is after 20 years, you're talking about a doubling of the size of the economy and so on. So there are serious issues that I think we should be looking at in terms of the climate crisis and the energy transition about whether it's time, I've already said we need to thank fossil fuels and send them on their way, give them a good wake, maybe you know, find other uses for the resource. I think we should also thank you know, uh, you know, capitalism and growth itself. You know, up to a point, these things are good. The proposition I'm making is that we have now reached a cancerous stage of capitalist growth. It's not actually adding social value. It's not even actually adding jobs. We have this phenomenon, particularly acute in the Republic of Ireland, of jobless growth. So it looks great on the GDP, gross domestic product. We see it all going up. No jobs are being created. Now surely I think we should be interested in jobs, not necessarily growth. So we should be decoupling a sense of social progress from carbon, from growth, and ultimately from capitalism, at least as a proposition to be uh, discussed. And I think the issues here is that, you know, there was a lot of enthusiasm, which I think is leeching away now, building back better. As we come out of the pandemic, we're going to lay down the, you know, the, the, the tram lines, the infrastructure, and so on for a green, inclusive recovery. Some elements of that are there. You could even look at the way Boris Johnson's levelling up campaign is partly based um, around that. But I actually think there is a desire, a bit like Dorothy in The Wizard of Oz, clicking our ruby slippers, saying there's no place like home, there's no place like home. What we see in our politicians, in the media, and I think amongst even most citizens, is a desire to return to the way things were, getting back to normal. I often say, why in the name of God do we want to go back to normal? Normal was the problem. Normal was ecocidal. Normal was creating a more unevenly you know, distributed society in terms of income, wealth and assets. But that's a political issue where most people want to cleave back to the security of what they had before as opposed to bounce forward in this transformative way to try something new. And that's a big issue. Because my own view uh, as an academic who's been working on this for, you know, 30 odd years, is the scale of what we're facing now is a paradigm shift in our thinking. It's akin to the shift from a feudal agricultural society that happened in Europe over 200 years ago in terms of the creation of a different type of society. And again, it's a challenge. Why are we cleaving to carbon through things like net zero? Net zero does not mean we have to remove carbon completely. And I understand that it's going to take decades for this transition, but particularly why the cleaving and the holding on to growth when we have the evidence that it's actually now suboptimal, there are other you know, uh, you know, objectives in the society we should be uh, attending to. But then the big issue, the structure of our economy in terms of a capitalist organization, is it actually delivering for everybody and equally? This is a really interesting study that just came out of Scotland, it's Wellbeing Alliance, counting and uh, assessing how economic growth has now become uneconomic growth. It's now causing more problems than it's solving, effectively. We are now putting more resources in our society to cleaning up the problems of growth than actually putting into other productive uses uh, within our economies and societies. So what about going beyond growth? 
And again, this is, this is not necessarily part of the just transition concept. I'm giving it an interpretation. It's an opportunity to say, well, okay, if we're going to be going to just transition and moving beyond carbon, why not throw this into the mix as well in terms of some of the issues to discuss? And particularly around, you know, this is uh, analysis coming from the OECD, the Organization of Cooperation of Economic Development, not a particularly radical organization based in Paris, but they've come up with a dashboard. And they've got a really interesting website where you can log on, go to your country of choice, and they have nine indicators. Growth is there. So the issue here is not to be anti-growth, but why is it the only or main thing that prioritizes itself and therefore everything else follows from it? What about these other issues of human flourishing, you know, mental health, uh, and so on, the cohesiveness of our societies, which we can measure now. Uh, so why aren't these counted as part of what we're doing in society? And it really is about seeing a shift away from our current, uh, what Naomi Klein would call the dig and gig economy, an extractivist linear economy that's now socially irrational, ecologically ignorant, and causing lots of social and other problems to the care and repair economy. We're going to have to repair quite a lot of the damaged natural systems that we have, but also caring uh, for, for each other in many respects. And maybe it's about moving from growth intensive led development towards a job rich, sustainable form of production. And this is an interesting uh, analysis done it's a couple of years now, 2009, by the New Economics Foundation. Again, Seeing the just transition and the energy transition is opening up an opportunity to talk about bigger issues which we haven't talked about in society in quite some time. But my view is unless we talk about these things, we will not manage to, to rise to the challenge and opportunities of the, of the planetary crisis. We limp along that greening business as usual simply will not do, empirically, politically, and particularly in terms of social inclusion. So the New Economics Foundation analyzed which jobs in society are socially useful in terms of what they come up with a metric of, of social value, which of course people can, can criticize. What they found is bankers, they, bankers destroy seven pounds of social value for every pound in value they generate. That's not a particularly good return on uh, investment. That's bankers. Whereas parents in childcare, for every one pound they're paid, they generate between seven and nine pounds fifty in terms again social value so it's again going beyond the simple profit bottom line to include uh, the full social value of these activities advertising executives boo they destroy eleven pounds of social value for every one pound that they generate tax accountants are the worst particularly because they enable very rich high wealth people to avoid paying taxes. They destroy 47 pounds of social value for every one pound that they generate. Now, these of course are contested, but I do think it is something that perhaps in the pandemic, we may have got a glimpse of. Why is it that the most valuable key workers that we all clapped for in our health service, in our retail sector, that lifted the bins, that kept the lights on, they're often paid lower than somebody pressing a screen in the city of London making currency exchanges. What's with that? I'm sure they would have valued it at the clap, but I'm sure they would like a, a decent pay rise and so on. So again, this is about under capitalism, the mismatch between what's well rewarded jobs, very high income, high wealth, high status, and actually the social value they generate can actually be destructive. That's not something most of us, we probably maybe intuitively get that sense of, of, of how we are. And it's quite a radical proposition that we're not valuing those who are key workers. You know, it did annoy me during the, the, the lockdown when you often got business groups coming on the, uh, the media saying, oh, the economy has closed down. No, it wasn't. The economy was reduced to its core functions that a society needs to, to sustain itself. And I would like to think that people have recognized that key workers are paid often low wages, they're very precariously employed, yet we are all seeing them for what the valuable work that, that it is they do. Yet it doesn't get recognized in the income. Never mind the fact that the unpaid work of women has for generations gone unrecognized in our official economic statistics. And if you don't think that's important, 
Next time you're talking to a business person, or particularly if they're a CEO, uh, the corporate executive officer or chief financial officer of a business, ask them, what's the value of the fact that they're toilet trained to the business that they're in? Not something that we often think about. That's an example of the valuable work and labor and care that mostly women do to prepare people then for society, including the world of work. And I do think, just to begin to wrap up, that in terms of the just transition, there are frontline communities, and many of them are demonstrating over in, in Glasgow, who are suffering climate breakdown. Uh, they're also suffering from extractivist forms of mining, particularly for things like electric cars, which I'll talk about in a, in a moment. And I don't think electric cars are going to be our solution alone. Well, I do believe, and I've, actually I do own an electric car, and I think hydrogen buses and so on. But there are issues to be considered in terms of the mining of the rare earth metals, uh, often in parts of Africa, under horrendous human rights conditions. Uh, so we can't put all our faith, I don't think, in electric cars. But I do think there's a commonality between those in the global south suffering from extractivism, in places like the, you know, uh, the Agoni people in Nigeria, and the Nobel Prize winner, you know, Ken Sarawiwa, who was murdered by the Nigerian junta because they were standing up against uh, fossil fuel extraction, particularly in terms of the connection between Shell and uh, the military junta. I think also frontline workers are those who are potentially facing displacement, you know, people in the mining of coal, oil and gas. They're also frontline workers. But I also think, just to go back to that housing retrofit and fuel poverty, I think in the global north, poor people, working class people living in badly insulated houses, they're on the front line as well. Because the challenge is, how do we connect all of these together? And I think trade unions have a role. I think also faith communities, to be fair, also have a role. I think there are other organisations that could have a place uh, in terms of connecting these frontline communities in this struggle as we move beyond you know, uh, an ecocidal system that we have at the moment that's you know, cooking the planet. And this is an example from the Heinrich Ball Siftung you know, in Germany, it's wonderful. Each party, when they reach a certain number of, uh, of votes, they can have state-funded. Well, st parties are funded by the state in Germany, which means they have lower levels of corruption. And so many issues that's going on over in Westminster now about double jobbing and so on. They're not absent in Germany, but they are different. And again, it's a, a, an argument in favour of state funding of political parties. But they do get their own foundations. This is the, this is the German Green Party Foundation, its research. And they looked into the unjust transition around electric vehicles, uh, particularly around forms of, of mining uh, and so on. It's also for wind blades and, and wind turbines also require some of these materials. So I don't think we should be naive to think that our major challenges, not just in terms of the physical, biophysical issues, but also with the human rights aspects of it. We cannot have a just transition where we're driving around in electric cars powered by wind blades off the North Antrim coast if the conditions under which those wind blades and electric cars were created were completely unjust. And that's a normative political issue that we have to uh, deal with. I do think we should see, from a trade union perspective, where is the solidarity uh, in terms of unions coming together to share information and, and knowledge, particularly in terms of calling out forms of greenwashing, which I think is what's exactly going on over in COP26. It is a grand form of greenwashing. You know, how can we begin to see, I and mean, we do this partly in the academy, probably not enough, of bringing together the collective intelligence of our people and say, well, how are we going to figure out transportation, energy, and so on? Uh, I, I think it's not enough because it's too much to ask any state to do this. The state ain't going to save us. It hasn't got the capacity. This is much, much bigger than the state. Businesses aren't going to save us. God forbid academics aren't going to save us. I know for damn sure Elon Musk and Jeff Bezos aren't going to save us either. But it isn't amazing how the media give those visits to the outer Earth's atmosphere more credence than somebody who's challenging capitalism. In other words, it's easier to give Elon Musk his stage to talk about colonizing Mars than to consider maybe the current economic system we have needs to change radically. And that tells us something about our society where as some of you may know the phrase, it's easier to imagine the end of the world than the end of capitalism. That, I'm picking for our young people who know nothing else in terms of that issue. But I just want to give you some examples of where workers and trade unions did 
initiate forms of technological innovation, which is a pity we didn't take up back in the late 1970s. The first one is the Lucas Aerospace Plan, where um, workers across a number of different unions came together and essentially they were making weapons. So it was a classic, if you're a Christian, swords into plowshare kind of story. Where how can we take our current destructive forms of production in the factory and, and, and science and technology and do something more socially useful? And the workers in this came up with a variety. This is back in 1977, 78. Hybrid power pack for vehicles, 1978. Heat pumps. They have flavoured them up now with the blonde bomber known as Boris Johnson, giving us all 5,000 pounds, well, I think it's in England, 5,000 pounds for heat pumps. Goes right back to 1977, where workers in the factory in Lucas Aerospace come up with this. Solar collectors, windmills, a little bit more. It's just an example of what happens when we empower workers um, and not simply see workers as passive recipients of whatever the state or a company um, are, are going to do and, and give them. And this man I've got a lot of time for, to my shame, I, I didn't know about him until about a year ago. His name is Mike Cooley, who, who was an Irish, Irish trade unionist from County Waterford. Um, and he was given the right livelihood, this kind of a, the alternative Nobel Prize back in 1981 for his work on the Lucas Aerospace. And his argument is about how can we have socially useful forms of production? I'll give you an example of some socially destructive forms of production. You could also read, for those of you interested in anthropology, he's sadly passed away now, David Graeber, who wrote a fantastic book, bestseller a few years ago, called Bullshit Jobs, where he calculated quite a lot of the jobs in our society are bullshit. They're not really adding any value, and so on. And again, that's an uncomfortable thing to say, because you sound like a woke, radical utopian. Uh, whereas for me, the non-woke, radical utopians are those who think we can green business as usual and continue indefinitely into the future. And this is where, you know, I do think there's a role. I'm looking here uh, at Fiona, uh, the president currently of UCU. Where are we bringing together the unions and mandate, the Irish Congress of Trade Unions, you know, um, the TUC, of coming up with, well, well what is the solution? And the unions are slowly getting on board, but I think there is a, 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 you know, a missed opportunity in terms of them getting more fully behind what are their proposals, because it's too easy to be what you're against. This is the big problem with people who are against things all the time. It's, it's, what are you for? What's the alternative? It has to be believable for people. And that's why I think, again, it's a simple idea. The housing retrofit, to me, stands as a great example of making it tangible for people. That's climate action. That's a low carbon, just energy transition right there in terms of housing retrofit. And I think what we're seeing now is that, that the just transition idea is being co-opted. It's written into the Paris 2015 agreement, which is great, but it's now being used by finance, by corporations, by politicians, often without any real sense of what it means, except I think what they mean by it is greening business as usual. So when you hear just transition, who's saying it? And I bet you it's probably some form of what I would call biofueling the Hummer. They're not talking about these much bigger issues because they're not interested in changing the structure of society. And maybe people in the room aren't either. And that's absolutely fine uh, as well. And I do think that the trade unions need to adopt a view that goes beyond the idea of simply compensating workers who are displaced in the energy transition. And I do think it's about normalizing much more radical, at least, discussions around the structure of our economy. And David already mentioned, and we didn't coordinate our presentations, uh, a trade union response that's, uh, to me, more, more radical is trade unions for energy democracy. It is technically possible now, with the transition to low carbon sources of energy, that we can democratize the energy means of production. Unlike fossil fuel centralized power plants or nuclear power stations, it's very hard to democratize those. But distributed forms of renewable energy, particularly solar and small-scale wind, they are possible to be able to be democratized where ordinary people can own and control the energy. So the issue here, what do we want? A privatized fossil fuel system or a privatized low-carbon energy system? Or do we want a mixed one where there's a much greater share for community-based energy and more ways of ordinary citizens to get involved in this transition? And how about a general strike by unions for the climate? You know, as opposed to just supporting the young people striking every Friday and the Fridays for the future, 
you know, this, it, you know, our ways of strategizing, of putting pressure on, on governments in terms of if people really are concerned about this, we should use whatever collective power we have in terms of moving on this. And there's the trade unions for energy democracy. My own view, and again, other people may disagree, where it, the situation we're in now is akin to wartime mobilization. If you read the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change report from August this year, it's the equivalent of scientists screaming at the top of their voices, saying, for God's sake, stop. You're going down the wrong path. And the IPCC is actually quite a conservative organization. A lot of the science that's produced has to be politically vetted, line by line. So it's not just peer-reviewed science, so it's already been politically washed, as it were. So it's a compromise anyway. So it always underestimates, uh, in many respects, what we're, we're facing. Some of you may have heard this man, Bill McKibben, you know, started the 365.org uh, you know, climate justice movement. He draws the analogy of the Second World War, where all the resources of society were brought together against the clear and present danger, initially after the attack on Pearl Harbor against the Japanese, and then as uh, the American troops moved over to fight the Nazis. That's the equivalent that we're, we're facing. And yet what we see is an incremental crab-wise movement of greenwashing. Nobody's against climate change now, not even Sammy Wilson, I think. So we have no credible climate denial, but what we have is climate delay. It's complicated, we haven't got the finance. And all the time, Mother Nature doesn't give a monkeys. She always bats last. The issue here is that we're running out of road in terms of how quick we need to make these changes. Now, you may disagree with this wartime mobilization. It's, too, it's not appropriate, it's, it's you know, too frightening. That's my own view of what we're facing. And the reason why I say that is because, in case you didn't know, we've declared a climate emergency in Northern Ireland. In February last year, just after the Assembly got back up and running, Belfast City Council declared one in October 2019. The Irish Parliament and the British uh, Westminster Parliament both declared one in May 2019. WTF? What's happened? These are rhetoric. Nothing has happened. The pandemic is what a real emergency looks like. That shows determined state action. So why are we not learning the lessons of the pandemic in terms of mobilizing resources against the clear and present danger of the planetary emergency? These are just a selection of headlines from British newspapers when the IPCC report came out. You know, this is code red. I mean, what more, what more do we need? We don't need any more science. I mean, we could be the first species in the universe to accurately document our own demise. We know what we're doing, and yet we're refusing to do it. Well, of course, who's the we? Is it the people over in COP26 inside the building with the 500 fossil fuel lobbyists, the single biggest delegation at that conference, which has led, although I, I stand to be corrected, that when the final communique comes out, as it currently stands, it does not mention the phasing out of fossil fuels. What it does say we have to phase out subsidies for fossil fuels. But actually, we know we have to move away from fossil fuels as quickly as we can. And yet, the communicator that's going to come out probably isn't going to say that. So I'm going to leave it there in terms of some of the policies that I had. You know, I, I think we need to discuss as we make, again, this energy transition. It's not just simply about greening business as usual. It is about looking at the structure of our economy. So why don't we socialize consumption? Move away from that individualized model, including public transportation and so on, as opposed to private car transportation. We do have some evidence moving that direction. I think it stands up economically and ecologically to actually have free public transportation on certain routes in cities. It would make economic sense, it would reduce air pollution and so on. And some cities around the world have actually done this. More in keeping what Dave was saying is what about democratizing work itself? Why should democracy end at the factory door? Why should democracy end at the office door? God forbid, why should democracy end at the lecture door? You know, why is it we live in democracies, yet for most of our lives in, in the world of work, we're living in despotisms, non-democratic, hierarchically arranged places. I've already mentioned that the particularly certain forms of low carbon energy enable the decentralization of energy. I think we need some forms of selective deglobalization 
Because when you have long supply chains, as we found out during the pandemic, and now with the impact of the protocol and Brexit and so on, we can be very vulnerable to certain goods and services. At the very least, let's have our food and our energy produced as locally as possible. They're the two key issues for any uh, society. And then what about then, you know, extending, uh, you know, participatory modes of engaging citizens in terms of provision of state services, which is just uh, another way of talking about democratisation of the state itself. But I'll leave it there. Uh, thanks for listening. And I'm more than happy, as I'm sure Dave is, to take any, any questions. So, John, thank you. David, thank you. Fascinating, thought-provoking, devastating in parts, um, but very, very interesting. Thank you. So, questions, anybody? Stunned into silence, no. I understand. I could frame it as a question. Okay. Um, and if, if, you, if you're insisting on questions. Questions or comments? Uh, and um, the, the uh, well, I mean, the first thing is to say a thank you to, to both um, Dave and, and John and, um, and just to, to, to recognize that this is a remarkable exploration of something so terribly important to, to us all. It's my second time today in Queen's and I'm not formally connected to Queen's but I don't have any other excuse to come up. But, uh, but the first was part of the social science um, uh, um, a fortnight that's taking place at the moment and it was concerned for how you tell your children um, and to, to use animations as a method of helping children understand what might be happening in the world. I know John has children. I have two little little lads, and uh, they're not eight yet, uh, twins, and I don't know how to bring this to them. So that's, but now, uh, notwithstanding that John says that it doesn't come from academia as to how this will be resolved, but maybe my question is, well, how, how can you say that? <laughs> uh, but uh, um, it, it perhaps is in, a, in an exploration of how we see the way, way out of it. So um, the question, I suppose, is in terms of, I mean, there's still a dichotomy as between the economic activity in its capitalist and somewhat centralist um, formats, if that still remains in China at all, uh, it does more so probably in Russia now than it does in China. Uh, the, the dichotomy between that economic system and the well-being of the planet. But the, it seemed to me that if, if those two sectors are placed um, in connection with each other, or in op in, to, to be truthful, in opposition to each other, uh, which is where, we, where it's brought us, that um, the third uh, uh, panel or the third circle of a Venn diagram uh, might well be the whole question of thought, reflection, economics, uh, uh, and uh, in, in the sort of approach that was taken here this evening. So um, uh, don't, don't you think that's the approach to take? Well, maybe I'll go first and let, let Dave in. I mean, you don't have to accept anything I said here tonight. The most important thing is that we need to have these conversations. So for me, it's always about educate, communicate, and then agitate, usually in that you know, order. My own view is that we need to understand ourselves, our own satisfaction, whether it's as bad as I've presented it, and uh, we have a, a short amount of time. What are the solutions? We have all the solutions and technologies we need. You know, but there is a political challenge to start changing structure of the economy, you know, start moving away from privatized consumption and globalization that have been embedded for you know, a number of years. But we didn't always live like this, folks. And people live pretty good lives. I mean, I, I could have shown you a graph which shows that in Western Europe, in particular, where we have more data, and North America, 
Uh, it's called the crocodile graph. So what you have is, is the top line is GDP. Economic growth is going along. We have a blip in, you know, uh, uh, you know, in terms of the OPEC oil crisis in the early 70s. Then you have another couple of blips. Obviously, we had one in 2008. But more or less, the, the trend is up. Economic growth is up. The bottom line is reported levels of satisfaction among citizens. Hasn't changed appreciably in 40 years. There's a whole complex series of reasons, but the economy is going up, it's booming away, and yet it's not really adding much value to people's lives. And I'm always uh, confused and intrigued as to why our public policy and our politics is aimed at the growth. At the very least, growth is a means to an end. So why aren't we focusing public policy on the ends themselves, which is why this dashboard of indicators, it's like driving a car. You don't drive a car looking at the speedometer. That's what GDP economic growth is. It's a measure of the speed of the production and circulation of goods and services by economic value in a year. Yes, of course, look at the speed, but what about the temperature gauge? You know, what about the fuel tank? We are driving an economy simply on the basis of speed and, and growth. Uh, and that's now become, as I say, it's reached a point where it's suboptimal. So this is not anti-growth. I think growth is needed in Africa, absolutely, in, you know, in the global south, because there's still enough available carbon space to enable them, even with some fossil fuels, but we need to go back in the west. Our issue in the global north is not growth, folks. It's redistribution. But again, I'd be doubly welcome as a fart in a spacesuit for saying that, because it's all based around growth and redistribution. Whereas actually we've got enough wealth in our society. The problem is it's all in South Belfast and out where I live in Hollywood and Cool Tra. So the issue is how do we then start having a less unequal society that stays within the planetary limits, the outer ring that we cannot transgress, and then also then we make sure nobody falls below a social floor. That's the lovely model of donut economics that Kate Rayworth has done so much to propagate. So the challenge in our societies is redistribution. It's quality of life, not necessarily quantity. Yet we're, we're, it's almost like we're, we're still on a treadmill of production and consumption that has long passed its sell-by date. You know, I'm always reminded of that lovely sketch in Monty Python of the dead parrot. Cultural reference that has gone over the head of most of the room because you're all far too young. Look it up. I'm sure it's on YouTube somewhere. It's a dead parrot. Let's give it a good burial, thank it for its service, and move on. The Stone Age did not end because of a lack of stones. The Oil Age will not end because of a lack of oil. That's what, why are we still going with the same system when it's biophysically impossible, it's socially irrational, it's making us ill, it's now in its cancerous state. That's what cancer is, folks. It's the point of the growth within an organism that now becomes unhealthy for the host. We are in the cancerous stage of growth. Before I let you in, Kira, I don't want to see if Dave wants to come in. I, I don't have much to add to that. Um, I do have a, a one-year-old child as well, and I've, uh, I found myself recently thinking about what, what the world's going to look like in 50 years' time. Not least will he have a metro train to get on, or but, but also a destroyed planet overall. But uh, you mentioned educate, educate and uh, communicate there, I think, John. But uh, you know the old one that we have in all of our newspapers when I look back over 100 years is uh, agitate, educate, organize. And what I see as the major problem, and it fits in with what you're saying there around redistribution, is that trade unions have become professional services rather than campaigners, campaigning organizations on issues that are relevant to them inside and outside of the workplace. Um, I consider myself a little bit of a trade union historian looking at stuff like the living in conditions, and living in system that, that happened in the early part of the last century and you know the eight hour day and all of your things, but they were you know workplace issues as well. This this is definitely a workplace issue too. It's about the, the type of living standard you're gonna have. And what we need now is trade unions to actually empower workers. I, I loved your presentation the slides where workers in the sixties and seventies are coming up with Solutions. This is exactly what we need, need more of. Not one or two people at the top of a trade union dictating what we need to do, but empowering the grassroots to be able to find the solutions that, that, that benefit them as well. And when it comes to, to redistribution, um, 
David workers to win those uh, outcomes for themselves. Means like one, one of the things I was trying to get across in my presentation was if, if you enable workers to do this, then to, to, to be able to take industrial action, to be able to win a larger slice of the pie, that provides the state with resources to be able to retrofit every household in the country because there's nothing to stop us, nothing to stop us from retrofitting every household in the country in a very quick fashion. Um, you'd know more about it than I would, John, but you know, we can easily get bonds, uh, hundred year bonds, uh, retrofit every household. Under the, un, under the, it, you know, it's almost like an investment for the few, for future generations who are going to be living in these houses anyway. So let inflation eat away at those bonds. Let us, let the next generation live on a sustainable planet. Um, and the only thing that's stopping us from doing it is ourselves and, and ourselves not being organised. So that's all I'd say. Um, we really need to get ourselves organised as workers in the trade union movement, but as a society as well. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, first of all, um, thank you to both of our speakers for excellent presentations. Um, so I have one question, and first of all, for climate change, it's a global problem which requires a global solution. So I came here because I know a lot about the European Green Deal, and part of that is the Just Transition Fund, where they funnel money to most, most deprived areas of the EU so that no one is left behind in the transition to renewable resources. However, they're having a problem because Poland is extremely dependent on coal and they don't want to move on from coal because they're scared that they're going to get dependent on Russia for their gas. And because of the power politics of that, that's something Poland really doesn't want to accept. So my question here is, how can we encourage coal-dependent countries to move on to renewable resources when the real politique of international relations says that they shouldn't? That's an excellent question. I mean, it, it partly explains why our energy prices have increased is because of our dependence upon uh, particularly Russian um, gas and, and so on. Interestingly enough, at the COP26 conference, Poland, which is extremely dependent upon coal, it has signed up to the phasing out of, of coal. The US, under green Uncle Joe Biden, didn't. And you could say, well, what's going on there? Is it the, the power of former uh, Trump supporters in Appalachia? There's also the politics going on um, in this energy transition. To me, it's partly around um, people demanding this change. You know, there, there's an intrinsic connection between uh, the science, but also in terms of, of people and, and using our democratic voice. In my view, also nonviolent direct action uh, in terms of that's a legitimate, um, you know, act of resistance and making your voice heard in the context of what we're, we're not seeing by our governments. I mean, they, they, they've declared climate and ecological emergencies and nothing has happened. How have our lives appreciably changed in, in many respects. The issue in, in terms of what you're talking about there in terms of Poland and, and Russia, well, it's because, you know, Western parts of, of Europe are so dependent upon Russian gas, that gives them the power. It's the reasons why, folk, um, that the West and the EU are sotto voce, they're very quiet often in criticizing the human rights abuses in Russia, because why would you bite the hand that feeds you? You know, uh, it's the, it explains the whole geopolitics of gas pipelines in that part of the world and why, you know, about eight years ago, I think it was, there was a standoff because most of the uh, Gazprom is the big, massive Russian um, gas company. It is um, uh, transporting uh, Russian gas from the east to the west through the Ukraine. And there was a standoff between Russia and Ukraine and Ukraine basically turned off the taps and actually people died in southern parts of Europe because they couldn't get it. That's the power. When you're an, a net fossil fuel importer, you're extremely vulnerable on this issue. So if nothing else, Poland has the capacity to generate its own renewable energy sources. But again, even before we get there, we should be talking about energy reduction, conservation, efficiency. And we've almost completely forgotten about that 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 could save quite a lot of energy in terms of what, what we need to do. 
And I'm always curious as to why that is not more prominent in our public debate in terms of, so the energy transition is not just, as I say, taking a quantum of carbon energy and replacing with the same quantum or a bigger quantum of renewable energy. We waste so much energy. If you don't believe me, walk around the university this evening. We're supposed to be smart people in the academy. And look at how many lights are, 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 are going to be on. Now, I have to be honest and say some of my colleagues may be working very hard this hour of the night. Probably not. Why aren't we instituting, like this, this particular building is a good example, or sorry, this particular lecture theatre, that whenever it, 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 there's sensors that detects when people are here, then the lights come on. You know, that's what I mean by energy conservation in terms of putting into place, you know, technology. And, and it's something that many people don't appreciate, um, is that our energy future is going to be the integration of information communications technology together with renewable energy systems in terms of you know, how we manage the, um, and there's lots of jobs available, lots of investment, lots of innovation required. But I do think quite a lot of what we need, not all of it, could be dealt with in terms of just looking at energy conservation. So it makes sense from a geopolitical point of view to have more of your energy produced domestically. And at least with coal, you could say Poland has a real politic reason to depend upon its own coal sources. There's now signal it's moving away from that. It's going to sign up to, you know, whatever comes out of COP in terms of phasing out coal. And therefore, for the global south, in places like India and other countries in South Africa, for example, are very heavily dependent upon coal. There has to be the as yet um, failure of the Western countries who developed using coal, oil and gas. You know, we are the, every cause, oh, China's the world's biggest greenhouse gas emitter. That is true, but historically, it's not India or China or South Africa. It's America, it's Europe, and so on, that are the uh, biggest causes of, uh, you know, what we're currently, you know, seeing in terms of greenhouse gas emissions. The last thing I'd say in terms of realpolitik is not only is it the global south who are already suffering the climate calamity, you know, we often think that, well, we had our first heat wave declared, amber heat warning in Ireland, whoever thought it, in July, where we issued a, an amber heat warning, also in, in the UK, quickly followed then by flash floods in parts of Belfast. This is going to be the, the pattern that we'll see. It'll be storm surges, sea level rises, do not buy a house in the Lower Omer Road, look at Rivers Agency flood maps just to see where you might want to buy um, a house. So the countries in the global south have been suffering this for quite some time. But yet, as many of my students know, the West is refusing to accept the extension of refugee protection for people displaced because of extreme weather. You cannot turn up to Belfast George City Airport and say, hi, I'm from Mozambique. We've had a massive hurricane uh, as a result of climate related events. Uh, I can no longer live there. I'm seeking protection. We are not extending that. And you could say that that's partly realpolitik in a negative way. Whereas we are, we are already seeing uh, mostly people displaced within their own country, uh, internally displaced people as they're called. But the projections are pretty stark. If you look at the IPCC, they're projecting millions of people that will be climate displaced in the decades ahead. Where are they going to go? Ireland is a pretty good place to be if things get really bad on the climate. We've got a low population density. We're relatively temperate, although that may change at the Gulf Stream cuts off and so on. How are we going to deal with the influx of climate refugees? I mean, just look at the calamity that happened when we had the Mediterranean Syrian crisis, which also was in part, folks, a climate change story. There was a drought in Syria, which preceded then, you know, the uprising against the al-Bashir regime. Climate change is now recognized in international relations and even military uh, and analysts as a threat enhancer. It, it makes things that are already bad even worse. So sorry, Dave, any, anything on the real politique? No, I think you're more qualified on that side of things. Thank you. We're running a bit over, John. Dave, one more question and then yeah. finish up. Sure. Come on ahead.
Thank you. Dave, I'm not sure if you heard that, and I'm actually going to go to Dave first. Uh, yeah, so this question was very much around, we have a, a colleague in the audience who is talking about the fears people have of joining trade unions, um, the concerns that they may have, you know, organisations nowadays bullying people into not joining trade unions. What would you say to alleviate the fears and to get people to join? Yeah, so uh, we come across that all the time in uh, represent workers in retail, so Home Stores, Tesco, um, Little, Aldi, all of the big multinationals who have a really soft, nice face uh, about them, but actually, you know, the, the example I gave of somebody going on strike and uh, have their hours, or joining the union, or going on strike, have their hours cut from 40 hours down to 15, that's a real example. That happened the day after our Home Store was strike in 2015, and they had a campaign retribution in the whole 110 stores across the, the country, um, where not only did they do that, they changed people's hours from working in the mornings to the evenings so that they couldn't manage the childcare facilities. They cut their hours below 19 hours per week so that they couldn't access supplementary social welfare like family income supplement and part time dole. Spread the hours over four or five days means you can't because the social welfare system in the South is antiquated, but um, it's done on a day to day basis. So there's a lot of victimization, and I had that in the Fair Work Act um, slide that, that we need to really tackle. Uh, victimization that happens because it's very, very real and it's very, very scary for people to join trade unions and particularly then to take action. Um, and here's the thing, about like, the, the the penalties for anything are minuscule. I mean, one of, one of the examples I give is that if I was to walk into a bank and rob the bank and, and, and walk out with all the money in the guard catch, catches me and he just says, put that money back, that's what happens when an employer steals there's no penalty in the No, they're just told to give the money to that worker when the, that worker has the courage to take the case. Now, you can only go back six months for your unpaid wages. You can't go back beyond six months. So why is there a limit of six months for a worker when there's, if it was the other way around, a worker taking money from his employer is completely the opposite. But that, that side of it is, is very real. And we need very strong anti-victimization clauses, including penalties, proper penalties. I think I heard parts of the question as well around trade union. Democracy, uh, and absolutely right. This is, again goes back to my point after the last question, the question before, uh, around becoming a, a more of a service or an insurance company for workers when something goes wrong. And I'm, I'm talking about workers engaged, grassroots, all the way up. And every trade union has a rule book, um, and workers need to look at those rule books, find out what's in them, and utilize that rule book and force motions through a conference so that the union takes a position. Right now, Mandate Trade Union, my own union, like, does not have a motion around climate change uh, effectively. I'm hoping that some of our members will put motions in the next conference, which is next April, demanding action from our union and demanding uh, action, you know, taken not necessarily against employees, but forcing some of the companies we collectively bargain with to, to implement climate action, um, climate actions within their policies and management policies. The amount of waste that we see in retail is a, it's a very simple thing to do that, that, that we request Tesco to use less carbon, use, use less uh, plastic, and you know, stop wrapping your bananas with the plastic. Bauxite, they put in around the wrappers themselves, uh, called skin. So there's, there's but, but getting back to that point about bureaucracy, again, engage, get involved your local branch, local council, and see trade unions for what they are. They're not a professional service, they're a, a, a democratization of the workplace. Um, John touched on it as well. More democracy in our society, not less. And the, the only place you're going to get democracy in the workplace, the only way you're going to have a democratic people, is through an effective trade union. And if you're going to get effective trade unions when people, social consciences get active in them. That's what's necessary. You're right, Dave. Thank you. John, have you got anything you want to add? Just, no, it's a really good question, but it's a bit like, you know, people who get annoyed at politics, particularly in Northern Ireland, and I can understand it. We can either do one of two things, we can sit back and throw your shoe at it, um, or we can get involved. And, and you know, even in, in politics, the same with trade unions, it doesn't necessarily have to be um, the traditional trade union activism, but it is about getting involved, because unless people get involved, it isn't going to change. Um, but it is about also recognising that there's misogyny, um, and there's all sorts of bureaucracy, and so on within the trade union movement. We all would recognise that. 
But really, what's the alternative? What's the alternative is, is the question. It's a flawed, like any human creation, it, it, it has its flaws. But remember, uh, the weekend was won by the trade union movement. The eight hour day was won by the trade union movement. You know, decent health care, paying conditions, all won by the health, by the trade union movement. So it has achieved. I mean, Dave is right, we're starting from a trade union perspective, not in a great place. But trade unions themselves are not the full picture of what we need to do. We are going to have to involve our politicians. Uh, we are going to have to involve our academics. I mean, I think Queen's, for example, could be doing an awful lot more in this space. In terms of, I have a real fear that our students are not being fully equipped for the 21st century. In terms of, we're teaching them things which are either going to be redundant and not possible, or actively harmful for what we're doing and what we need in the years um, ahead. You know, I don't know whether my Vice Chancellor, Ian Greer, hi Ian, uh, will actually agree, but my own strong view is that we need to audit all our education, not just in, in university, but all the way down. Are we equipping our citizens, our entrepreneurs, our leaders of tomorrow with the right knowledge uh, and so on? And trade unionization and activism is one way of doing that. I do think we're going to have to, you know, uh, also recognize that there are other organizations that need to put their shoulder to the wheel here. What would Jesus drive if you're a Christian? You know, where are Christians in this space? From their point of view, it's God's earth. It's a sense of stewardship. Yet, I'm not seeing the churches coming out as strongly as they should. You know, and I speak now as a completely collapsed Catholic, but the, you know, uh, the good book has some good lines, including, I'll just end on this, is, is a secular form of, without vision, the people perish. What we're lacking at the moment is a vision of what this green, regenerative, low-carbon economy looks like. I've offered you the outline, and I think with Dave as well, a complementary sense. It's a much more radical, transformed vision than what we have at the moment, which is basically not greening capitalism as, as we currently know it. That's perfectly a, a position that people may take. They just want to reform what we have. I just think biophysically it will not work. It may extend for maybe a couple of decades. It's just not going to work empirically. We have to radically change the structure of our economy, move towards things like libraries, you know, public transportation, um, you know, radically, I, I think, democratizing our energy system where possible in a mixed economy, but also get back to some fundamental issues if you haven't dealt with in society in maybe 40 years, that certain things in our society, I think, and I think Dave would agree, and maybe some in the, in the audience would agree, some may disagree, things like healthcare, housing, education, these things should not be commodities as they currently are. Now that debate was lost in the 1980s with the rise of neoliberalism and Thatcherism and so on. But guess what? The pandemic has shown us it ain't the free market that saves you, folks. It's the state and the solidarity of people. And that gives me hope. And hope is always generated through activism. It has to be active. Don't be sitting back taking a ticket waiting for the state to save us. That's not going to work. We'll try it maybe and it will fail. It's about people demanding better, collectively trying to figure out. And I think we have to have an honest conversation of, of saying what we feel as well as what we think. It's with the head, hand and the heart. I mean, it's extraordinary the moment that we're in. It is not going to be solved simply by cognitive intellectual capacity. We're going to need that. It won't be solved simply by bleeding heart, liberal you know, issues around care and concern, although we need that too. And of course, we need to put this into practice. I mean, again, I was giving you my honest sense as an academic, as a father, as a trade unionist and an activist, is that we need to have these conversations. Whether you agree with anything I've said or Dave said tonight, at least what's the response? If not what we're proposing, well, what is going to work and what's your reasons why? So I'd like to thank you all for coming tonight and giving up your, your Wednesday evening. Hopefully you come along to see John McDonnell, give a much more eloquent outline of what myself and Dave, we're out to warm up back for him. Uh, and thanks, Fiona, for sharing. No, nope, thank you for inviting me up. Yep, thank you, Dave. Thank you, John. Um, yep, go away from here tonight. Think about what's been talked about. Speak to your friends, speak to your colleagues. Join a trade union. Um, and yep, thank you very much. That's great. Thank you all.
Thank you.